to have uh, uh, Dr. Salam Fayyad, His Excellency, former uh, Prime Minister uh, of Palestine and former Minister of Finance, and a man who has had an incredibly illustrious career and uh, hopefully uh, will have uh, a lot more to contribute uh, to the betterment of that region. This, to me, uh, is an incredibly personal moment as well because I've been friends with Salam for decades and I want to acknowledge also his wife, Bashair Haloti, who is here with us uh, uh, today, uh, we've been family friends uh, since the days I was growing up uh, in Amman, uh, and so this is very poignant for me. And to welcome Salam uh, twice at Colombia. The first time I welcomed him at Colombia was in Amman when he was prime minister and he spoke at the uh, Colombia Global Centers um, in, in Amman. So to have him back here uh, is a really uh, a special honor. Uh, I'll introduce uh, the prime minister um, in a couple of um, seconds. And then what we thought we would do is engage in a conversation. I'll uh, uh, throw a few questions and uh, we'll talk maybe for about uh, 30, 40 minutes. Uh, we'll try not to exceed 40 minutes. And then we'll open it up so that there is a wider conversation um, with, the, with the audience. Uh, so Dr. Fayyad uh, served as Prime Minister from June of 2007 till June of 2013. Um, before that, he also served as Minister of Finance uh, in multiple governments uh, in the Palestinian Authority. Uh, his career uh, has really been one of an economist. He obtained his uh, PhD in economics from the University of Texas, Austin in 87, um, and uh, worked with the IMF uh, from 87 until 2001, including a stint between 1996 and 2001 as a resident expert for the IMF in the uh, Palestinian, uh, Palestinian territories. Um, and we were reminiscing before this about uh, seeing one another in 1987-88 when you lived in, in Washington. Um, Salam is from uh, my hometown of Nablus, um, and so that's another thing that makes me feel uh, um, very, very privileged. Uh, as Prime Minister, and before that as Finance Minister, Salam Fayyad was really uh, a very different kind of Palestinian leader. Uh, he was very focused on building institutions and believed that by building institutions, reviving the economy, adhering to contractual agreements in letter and spirit, uh, even while the other side did not, uh, that international and Arab pressure would force Israel to recognize Palestinian rights and legitimize a de facto state. So basically, his mantra has been uh, the institutionalization um, of a separation of powers, developing of free economy, uh, reform and upgrade existing infrastructure, modernize and professionalize Palestinian security services, and create new infrastructure such as government offices, stock market, and airports. So the idea is, you know, build institutions and create a state as you're asking for rights, that rights become uh, more easily attainable and independence become more realistic once those state institutions had been uh, put, in, put into place. That is, you know, it sounds incredibly rational, incredibly logical. It's the kind of thing that for you, especially CIPA students amongst you, um, should seem very natural, but was very revolutionary and uh, was not incredibly um, well um, accepted. Uh, another thing that distinguishes uh, Salam Fayyad's tenure, in my opinion, is the fact that he was very well respected by people on all sides. Um, you know, the fact that he had a, a very um, open mind about things, that he had his training here in the West, understood the West, um, you know, a man with incredible integrity uh, and credibility. Uh, or, or allowed him to have credibility with, uh, with all the parties involved. So, uh, you know, both the, the Israelis considered him, uh, according to Haaretz, for example, uh, they once wrote in Haaretz, the ideal partner. Uh, he is the classic example, and I'm quoting here, of a Palestinian who has spent a great deal of time in the West and has acquired Western behavior and values that have made that kind of uh, um, interaction uh, possible. Uh, but you were under siege from political rivals within, uh, within the PA. Um, I think it's fair to say that when you resigned in June of uh, 2013, it was not on the best of terms with Mahmoud Abbas, uh, but maybe you can el elucidate uh, uh, on that. Um, but I think what we want to talk about, but under your tenure, not only were institutions built, but the economy 
uh, did perform incredibly well. Uh, in 2010, uh, GDP growth in the Palestinian territories reached 9.3%, 9.3%, at a time when uh, comparably, you know, countries in the region uh, did not exceed 4% GDP growth at that time. Uh, the Palestinian Authority was able to pay the salaries of its 146,000 employees in the West Bank almost on time, which is, again, unprecedented and I think uh, unmatched um, since that time. Um, the uh, UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the European Union, all issued reports praising the PA for its commitment, financial transparency, delivery of public services, and economic policies under Salam Fayyad. Uh, the IMF even labeled the PA's finances a model for developing countries in terms of um, transparency. <coughs> Um, and I think uh, you were quoted once, Salam, as saying that uh, you considered that, uh, this recognition, as the birth certificate of the reality of the state of uh, Palestine. Um, so with all of that uh, sort of as background, uh, I think it would be very interesting to talk with Prime Minister Fayyad uh, about where he sees things are now, what he thinks about the uh, governance institutions within the uh, Palestinian um, territories within the Palestinian Authority, uh, talk a little bit about the conditions in the Palestinian territories under his tenure and how those may have been sustained or how they may have changed, uh, and then maybe talk a little bit about current affairs and what's coming out of the White House, what's coming out of Washington, what's coming out of Riyadh and Abu Dhabi um, and uh, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and elsewhere. Uh, so I want to start, Salam, uh, with the paper that you shared with me recently, that you wrote in Arabic a couple of years ago. I think you first presented it in November of 2016, um, so about a year and a half ago, and translated into two words, building Palestinian consensus on an interim state-building program. Uh, and I found it to be an incredibly interesting paper in which you discuss how the fragmentation of the Palestinian political system which has been exacerbated since 2007, threatens the Palestinian cause. Uh, but you propose in this paper a participatory approach to the development of an interim state-building program that ensures the full and effective inclusion of all political factions in decision-making, state management, and representation. Um, you include in the paper a suggestion of a Palestinian national unity government composed of the first rank leaders of all factions and authorizing them to the maximum extent permitted by law to rebuild and unify national institutions and carry out all the responsibilities assigned to them as stipulated in the Constitution. So let's hear about that, hear about this approach, how feasible is it, uh, what needs to happen to bring the various factions together, and uh, sort of as background, perhaps uh, as context, a couple of weeks ago there was uh, an incident in Gaza uh, that is uh, thought to have been an assassination attempt against your, uh, uh, your successor, uh, Rami Hamdallah. Um, so fractions within the Palestinian Authority, uh, attempts to bring them together, um, you know, the, the, the fact that you also were interested in us stopping at this point is, is, is the assumption that perhaps one of the biggest stumbling blocks facing Palestinian aspirations is Palestinian leadership and the structure of that leadership and the relationships and the dynamics within that leadership. So, let's start there. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. I'll try to deal with the issues that you raised, but not before I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'd like also to start by thanking uh, Farah Hassana for the introduction. I I'd like to also thank the MANA Forum, uh, Palestine Working Group, as well as Columbia Global Center. Uh, great privilege for me to be here in Columbia uh, to share some thoughts about what's going on back home, uh, this part of the world, as things relate to uh, certain developments here to there and back and forth. Beginning with what you already talked about, uh, it's the ideas that I had, or proposals, if you will, I had put forward in an effort to try to find a platform around which uh, Palestinians of different political persuasions could converge and coalesce, uh, because I uh, felt it all along very important for that to be 
the starting point for us if we're going to really be able uh, to break away from a vicious cycle that we have been in for a very long period of time. Uh, seems to me uh, quite logical, by the way, uh, thank you uh, also for your interest and uh, for being here. I hope you do not hold any what's a fun said against me, uh, including being an economist, uh, what other things you said. Uh, I am a person, uh, graduate of University of Texas, Boston. Uh, from Naples, I was just born in Naples, actually, because there's a hospital there, that's all. Uh, yeah, that, that, that doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Naples, you know, you, it, it claims you. Uh, no one is perfect, as I would say. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, here we are. But I all along felt it important. You, you said something about uh, how logical uh, you know, all of this uh, was. Uh, you know, thinking about working toward projecting the reality uh, of Palestinian statehood on the ground. And uh, the quote that you really actually cited, uh, where I uh, basically described what those international institutions said, along with uh, all the key powers uh, meeting at the Donald Conference in Brussels back in uh, April 2011, uh, I described it as a birth certificate for the reality of state of Palestine uh, to be distinguished for the state itself. Uh, reality being the institutions of the state, the services those uh, institutions are capable of delivering to the people, uh, etc., etc. That to me uh, was most logical uh, thing to really focus on, and I do not believe it uh, really took the, the, the uh, it, it was subject matter of adequate uh, interest all along in our quest for uh, ability to be to be able to exercise our right to self determination one for another going back actually to the 20th of last century even. Uh, you know, in, in retrospect, of course, you, you raised issues as to what happened. I mean, that was the idea, that was the mantra. Uh, things didn't work out. Uh, uh, and sure, there are many objective reasons as to why that did not happen. I'll touch on some of those, at least, as best as I could. Uh, but that really does not negate the premise of the validity of what we're really talking about. If it is a state that we're looking for, by we, I mean Palestinians, it stands to reason that the one thing that we should preoccupy ourselves with the most is to actually project its reality on the ground, to build its institutions. I mean, I do distinguish between that on the one hand and sovereignty on the other. Sovereignty is going to really be the product of the process that's going to really lead to Israel ceding control over the territory that occupied in 1967 in order for that state to be sovereign. But that does not really mean, should not really have ever meant, you know, waiting until the uh, occupation ended for the act of building the state institutions and projecting the reality of that state on the ground to begin. Uh, it, it made great deal of sense then, it made great deal of sense now, particularly since various attempts at trying to resolve this conflict top down uh, did not work out. Uh, and uh, I do not really believe, uh, given the fact that the gap was always wide and it has grown progressively wider uh, actually since mid-90s, certainly around the turn of the century onward. Uh, if that did not happen back uh, shortly after uh, Oslo uh, Accords were concluded, uh, I just don't see that happening anytime soon. Worse, the prospects of Palestinian statehood uh, happening anytime soon look a lot dimmer today than they did back in 1999 when that interim uh, arrangement was supposed to really actually come to an end in May 1999. So with, with that before us, uh, how is it really going to be possible? Uh, with the gap having widened to the extent it has, uh, how is it going to be possible for that gap to be bridged today on the strength of a top-down intervention, just like making it happen, saying these are the parameters, and it didn't happen before, it's not going to happen anytime soon. It's not that this really uh, is the reason why we should preoccupy ourselves with projecting the reality of our state put on the ground, but it adds to the reasons why we should really do that and focus on that, uh, instead of just basically saying there's not really much that can be done. Uh, true if a top-down process is what we're talking about, but not true if actually doing something about the welfare of our people, uh, about sense of hope and possibility to be created, about institutions being built in order for the reality of that state to be projected on the ground in spite of the occupation. I'm fully aware 
on the difficulty of the task. I mean, I tried doing it uh, with, with colleagues and everyone else. Uh, under the best of circumstances, it's not an easy thing to do. It's a lot more challenging to do in the context of a highly oppressive and capricious uh, control regime that's associated with the occupation with all of its facets of oppression and capriciousness, uh, including the siege of Gaza, including restrictions on mobility in the West Bank, virtually complete control over nearly 60% of the land mass of the West Bank, uh, that's labeled Area C under post Accord, et cetera, et cetera. All of this said, it does not really mean that nothing can be done. I'm here to tell you that it is impossible to really build a perfect model of state under these conditions, and I accept that. But equally, uh, I'm, 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 I would also tell you that uh, doing nothing uh, is, is not a corollary. It should not be a corollary. It, it may sound like it's a corollary, but it isn't. It isn't. Uh, we can do something, and the idea was on the strength of trying to do it, making progress toward it, with the reality of it becoming more and more in evidence uh, as we went along, that that reality it would grow enough on people on all sides and would be highly transformative to bring about a resolution. That, I think, uh, uh, continues to be valid in my view. But in order for that to take off, we need to unite ourselves. You accurately said, referred to the separation that took place uh, in, in 2007 as having become more severe. And that's really exactly the way I described it. Because the separation politically uh, actually started long before 2007. It happened upon the signing of the Oslo Accords. There was a period of five year period of consensus uh, that was unprecedented in the history of Palestinian courts, actually, on the national scene. And that was the period between 1988, when our late President Yasser Arafat stood up in Algiers and said, on behalf, uh, in the name of God, in the name of the Arab Palestinian people, the Palestinian National Council hereby declares the establishment of state of Palestine. That was November 1988. He, when he said that, actually, that ushered a period of virtually complete consensus on the Palestinian side that lasted for about five years. It was the first time uh, we Palestinians signaled formally willingness to accept uh, as a solution this conflict a state on 22% of historical Palestine. Uh, and all of that. And that consensus, I believe, lasted for nearly five years. Uh, Oslo happened upon the sign of Oslo that broke down. So that's when the political separation actually started, I believe. Now, it became a lot more severe in 2007, uh, for sure, the separation that, that happened in Gaza. To this day, uh, rectifying uh, that division and fixing it uh, really is key priority. And it's, I think, the starting point of any meaningful uh, effort aimed at empowering ourselves. Empowerment is really what we should be looking for. Ending the Israeli occupation is a top national priority for sure. Building a state where our people are able to live as free people with dignity in a country of our own, like all peoples around the world, is an absolute necessity. But it's a Palestinian state that we're talking about. It's up to us Palestinians before it is up to anyone else to build it. That, I think, is what it is. It, 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 this is a call, essentially, for us to assume full agency in our own liberation. That's my definition of empowerment. First step toward that is unifying our polity, which is divided. I put before you very quickly, and I do not want to really spend all the time on this issue, although I am really keenly interested in your own reaction to these ideas, because as the fund rightly pointed out, uh, I uh, based on a paper that I actually presented back in 2016, but the genesis of those ideas goes many years before, in contacts that were basically handled by intermediaries back and forth. Uh, as Prime Minister, and I can share this with you, it was not my job, uh, it was not my, I couldn't get involved directly in the process of reconciliation, I was not really party to that, that was for the faction to do, and the President himself handled those things, But 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 not me. This didn't really mean I had absolutely no, no role in formally. So I was really kind of passing you know, ideas of this kind. I knew all along, and I have evidence of that, actually going back to 2008, that insisting on a unity that is based on all Palestinian factions accepting the PLO program as it was amended after Oslo was impossible. I mean, I, I realized this the, early on. So 
to really continue to say uh, that here it is, we will unify ourselves, and the PLO is open for everybody, provided everybody accepted the PLO platform as it was. It was impossible then, it is impossible today, and quite frankly, I do not see that happening anytime soon. So if that really were to continue to be held as an absolute requirement, this is equal to basically accepting the situation of division continuing. Mm. I mean, if it, you don't get me wrong, if it were possible for all Palestinians or you know, relevant, significant Palestinian political powers to converge on anything, I would join in, for sure. I just don't see that happening, to be honest with you. So what do we do in a situation like this? Uh, some would say, you know, let's just do away with the PLO altogether. Uh, and all of its platforms, especially after it was re amended back uh, to really basically fit the requirements under OSCO. Some would say, no, it's the PLO that really got us to where we are. I mean, uh, first of all, it's the PLO that really basically uh, uh, safeguarded uh, our sense of identity, which is, which is clearly important, and championed the struggle for freedom for, for decades uh, before. Uh, for us to uh, really just basically forget about it completely, just insane. Why don't ev why don't everybody join in and then we'll discuss it? Uh, others would like to differ, particularly given the fact this is a fact, not conjecture, that the back that the PLO had made back in the mid 90s on Oslo had failed. Mm -hmm. I mean, regardless of the intentions and the effort and and all that has gone into this process, trying to make it work regardless of the depth of goodwill internationally in making this happen, and the great sense of euphoria that really actually was associated with the scene of handshakes here and there and meetings uh, and feel-good events and what have you. The fact of the matter is, looking at the situation as objectively as we must, it failed. What, why did it fail, in your opinion? I mean, what, what were the, the things that drove it, especially from the perspective of uh, the, the Palestinian uh, leadership, PLO, and the factions. Early on, look, there may have been, uh, uh, I think, uh, a window of opportunity shortly after, uh, you know, the, or around the time when the deal was concluded. There may have been one. There may have been one. I can't be 100% certain. The reason I say I can't be 100% certain is because even though I personally was not involved, uh, but I know enough about the history of the accords and the negotiations, what happened and who was saying what to who uh, at the time, uh, on both sides, to really uh, 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 not be 100% certain uh, that that window existed. But to the extent one existed, it was short-lived and it cannot have extended well beyond the period after the signing of the Declaration, for a variety of reasons. Including, when you look at it, I mean, the fact that the parties recognized was going to, going to be very difficult for them to agree on a resolution to certain issues. Of, they set them aside for negotiations later, calling them permanent status issues, you know, refugees, Jerusalem, and what have you. These are issues that you know, both sides felt they could not really agree at the time of, of Oslo itself, so they, they decided to defer. Just looking at that by itself suggests to you that there was certain knowledge that there was not going to be automaticity to this uh, at all. And these are really borders, these are security, these are really important issues, obviously. So all of them were postponed for further consideration. So this is something that should have suggested to people that, well, you know, it's not as easy as it looks. This is one. I think more importantly, this is not something that many people know about. More importantly, if you were to look at the structure of the Oslo Accord. If you're Palestinian and you know you read through them carefully, you would have had many, many reasons to be very worried. There's not a, even a suggestion of Palestinian sovereignty in the agreement itself. Not at all. So the notion that somehow we are promised a state in Oslo, that itself is subject to question. You're not going to be a, find a single reference to Palestinian statehood in Oslo uh, in the Oslo Accord system. You're not going to find even a suggestion of possible, possible sovereignty. There's a reason for this. There's a reason for this. This is exactly what the Israeli delegation was told before the final round of negotiation. And I quote without really attribution. Make statehood 
a possibility, but not the outcome, necessarily. So it all was up in the air. And if you really look at the way this, this whole thing was structured, it was about an interim period that was to last five years, during which time, you know, Palestinians would have control uh, over part of the territory uh, in the administrative and security sphere. Uh, no reference to sovereignty. And I can tell you, uh, you cited my tenure as a representative of IMF uh, in the 90s and all. And I can tell you, I was at many meetings where, uh, donor meetings, representing the IMF at the time, I was not uh, part of the PA, uh, where meetings almost broke down because the Israeli delegation did not like a, a reference in a particular document or a map to solve. That was suggestive of the possibility of sovereignty or, 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 or some notion of borders, or anything like that. That the meeting would actually almost break down. What people really take for granted there, say Palestine, say to Palestine, uh, uh, they take it really readily uh, for, for granted. Uh, and so much so that many really thought that was there. It, for sure there was going to be a state of value. Not true. <coughs> So that itself should have really uh, been a, a source of much alarm. And for those on the Palestinian side who were skeptical, uh, when that happened, they had every reason to be skeptical. Uh, you know, this is not uh, to say anything. You know, this is not to speak ill of what was done. Uh, I, I think basically the idea was, you know, let's take what we get. We work on it. And with international interest and all, it's all really going it to work. The reality. It becomes reality. It's going to really work. Mm. Uh, uh, well, uh, it did. Uh, of course, people who really analyze the situation more clinically, uh, if you will, look at certain incidents and, and they tell you um, uh, things that, for sure, um, uh, are, are significant uh, right. in, in terms of really what happened. The assassination of uh, the late Prime Minister Itzhak uh, for example. Uh, many. Uh, uh, say uh, and, and take it as a given that that definitely was a, a, a significant setback to the process uh, for sure. Uh, and and that was the, the, the breakdown of the consensus that was between 88 and I, I think the consensus, to tell you the truth, uh, you know, looking back at our history during that period is most instructive. And I think it, it probably would, would help us all if we really look at that and analyze it objectively, uh, uh, you know, away from preconceived notions of what really should happen, what, what, what shouldn't. Um, the, there was, you know, the day our late president, Esther Abad, gave that speech in Algiers, uh, it was very significant. Everybody in the President National Council stood up in, 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 in tears, clapping and cheering. And what he said, the words that I just cited to you, in the name of God, in the name of Arab Palestinian people, the Palestinian National Council declares the establishment of the state of Palestine. There was really an incredibly emotional moment for, for people. Uh, and they were crying. They all stood up and they were cheering. Not really fully comprehending that the other side of the coin of what was said is I hereby declare that we are prepared to accept as solution of this conflict a state on 22% of our ancestral land. It's an amazing speech for you to think about it. The world, of course, are interested in, in political speeches and, and how you know they can be sometimes formulated. So, it, almost immediately, the next day, people say, "What did we really agree to?" <laughs> yeah, you know, there was this kind of. What it was was this this kind of yeah. But it did not produce a rift. You know, people went along. All the PLO factions stayed within. You know, uh, that's for sure. But when Oslo happened, Oslo sounded a lot different to many from the very beginning. Last thing I would say about the structure of Oslo. Uh, it's important, it's particularly for the students here, students of uh, political history and how agreements are negotiated. And, uh, it's very interesting even what things are called. Uh, and it's, I really implore you to really actually look at that. But by the way, we are so significant to world events that if you were to Google, I tried this and I, I believe me it works. If you Google uh, the declaration of mutual recognition, you don't say Palestine, you don't say Israel, you don't say anything. It will direct you to the so-called declaration of mutual recognition between Palestinians and Israelis uh, of September 1993, and the actual documents. Mm -hmm. And if you really actually read those documents, you will immediately conclude there was nothing, uh, 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 you know, mutual about this. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in, in terms of the standards of what was recognized, uh, there were actually 
people think there are two letters, there is a letter also the Norwegian Foreign Minister, but just let's just focus on the letter exchange between uh, President Arafat and uh, Prime Minister Rabin at the time. It, the sequence started with a letter from our late president to Prime Minister Rabin saying uh, uh, the PLO recognizes the right of the State of Israel to exist in peace and security. That's number one. And number two, uh, something that's stronger, is on renunciation of violence. The same day, Rabin answered, on the basis of your letter, on the basis of your letter, the government of Israel recognizes the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people. There's just absolutely no congruence. There's absolutely no symmetry, if you really think about it. Here it is, you have a, a recognition by the PLO acting on behalf of all Palestinians, not of Israel, not of Israel's existence, of its right to exist in peace and security. It's an amazing formulation. No such formulation exists in the history of recognitions among states, where a state recognizes the right of a state to exist in peace and security. Well, the words they are supposed to mean something. And I believe our historical narrative, by virtue of the use of those words, was superseded, superseded with that signature. So this is how significant this was. And in return for which, what did we get? Not a recognition of a single national right of ours. And if you really think about it, Israel recognizing the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people was self-serving. Because in order to give, to give meaningful content to the PLO's recognition of the right of the state of Israel to exist security. So if there was hesitation, even though people maybe did not really analyze things to this extent. They had every reason to be worried. So that's when the division really occurred. Then came 2007, many years later. Uh, so let's bring it back to the moment that you had approached and you suggested. Yeah, basically what I say here is, we know all of these, but it's not that I really favor division and, and, uh, and all of that. But let's just really think about this as a challenge in managing pluralism. Uh, pluralism, after all, is a good thing. Uh, maybe not to write about democracy, you thought it was on democracy. So I doubt that there's a cause on the, it was on the verges of authoritarianism and, and totalitarianism and what have you. So let's look at this as a challenge. That's why I would write, really like to involve you, think about this as a challenge, in trying to manage pluralism uh, in the Palestinian context. And it's unique. Uh, it's difficult as it is, but it's made more complicated, vastly more complicated by the fact that it's occupation and the fact that, you know, we are operating under international constraints related to provision of aid and what have you, and internationally imposed conditions on the possibility of unification. So it's very complicated. That's why I really would like for you to think about this as an exercise, uh, even if only academically, and, and, and see what you think about those ideas. So my approach is basically says this. So I understand that the bet the PLO made back uh, in 1993 failed, uh, for sure. I also see it as a, a fact that the political weight of the opposition has risen over that. Yes, it fluctuated up and down and up and down, but, and I'm talking about, you know, factions like Hamas and Jihad, but their standing, you know, rose significantly up to the point where they won national elections back in 2006, for sure. So, they're not like a minority, you know, party that can be dismissed as uh, insignificant or anything like that. Whether they're Hamas, Jihad, or even members of the PLO coalition, or independents who are within the umbrella of PLO, there are many on the Palestinian side who believe that the PLO platform and its approach has simply not worked, and maybe we should be looking for something else. And I'd say, yes, we definitely should be looking for a political vision on which we all can converge. At the same time, I think this is going to really take a very long period of time. Uh, all the more reason to begin. My suggestion is not to wait until we really conclude this discourse. I think this is something that we should continue to really talk about until we find something that we all can agree on. And, and avoiding all along uh, ambiguity. Uh, I'm not really for language that can be read different ways by different people. What I propose is very clear, crystal clear. It's clear on the tricks that are involved. There's nothing underhanded in this. 
everybody needs to understand what we're really doing. So basically, the idea is, <coughs> is to say this. It is a program that failed, but it happens to be the program on the basis of which the world has recognized us, on the basis of which we have bridges to the rest of the world. It's important to really keep in mind. And I say this, full sense of responsibility toward at least the five million Palestinians who live in the territory of Israel occupied in 1967. In order for us to really take good care of ourselves and so far as that is concerned, plus other responsibilities toward Palestinians, diaspora, and whatnot, we just simply cannot take too lightly, you know, those bridges that have been established for the rest of the international community. That's one set of consideration. The other, again, is that the increasing or at least increased weight of the opposition. They cannot be dismissed. And the impossibility, as I see it, of them sort of all of a sudden saying, you know, we'll change our mind. Okay, we will accept the fear of that platform. They're not going to do that. So I say, let's talk about finding something about the can agree. Until we are able to really come to a conclusion, let us really think about transitional program, where we look instead of really for an overarching unifying vision forever, we look for a unifying vision for a number of years, trans transitional period. We can agree on you know, number of years, three years, four years, whatever. But it's the number of years, as a practitioner, I can tell you, I have a suggestion. It's the number of years I think it would take us to unify our institutions, laws and regulations after more than a decade of separation between Gaza and West Bank. We have two ministers and everything, two agents and everything, two sets of laws and regulations, many, many things. This is serious work. It, you know, it cannot be you know, done overnight. So it will take us a number of years before we'll be able to really do this. Empowerment is, is our agenda. That's what we should do. We should empower ourselves to the fullest extent possible, even under occupation, in spite of the occupation, to end it. To end it. This is not Sisyphean uh, exercise. This is something that can really be accomplished. Uh, so with, with, with that in mind, I say, until it is possible for us to agree on, on, on something and have elections for the National Council that I referred to before, the one that really actually convened in Algiers back in 1988 and subsequently a couple of times, and the one that's scheduled to convene again on 30th of April uh, in Ramallah, until we are able to broaden the base to include everyone on the basis of unifying political vision, either by elections or through an objectively agreed set of criteria, like you take 30%, you take 20%, you take whatever. Mm. Until we're able to do that, let's do the following. Everybody, all of us, whether you are in the PLO or not in the PLO, will have to accept the PLO as our legitimate, as our sole legitimate representative. Let's all agree to that. The immediate question that you will ask me is, how is Hamas going to really accept to consider the PLO as the sole legitimate representative of Palestinian people when it's not in it. How is Jihad going to really accept to do that when it's not in it? How are many of those who are in the PLO already, who really have been totally disillusioned by the program, by performance, by what have you, are going to really accept that? I'd say, wait, you know, second item. There is a compromise in this, and I'm very explicit on it. I'm very explicit on it. The compromise I'm making here really relates to the essence, the nature of the representational role. What, what do we mean when we say so legitimate representative personality? So far, it has meant the power to decide. So far. PLO, it's our so legitimate representative. So far, it effectively has meant the capacity to decide on our behalf. So on any given afternoon, the PLO convening its exact committee or the president something, can pick up the phone and make it and say, this is what we want to and do. And you want to turn that on its head and basically make it more uh, the voice. It, it, exactly. I, I say, you know, we, we, it retains the title, it retains the title as our sole legitimate representative in a capacity as conveyor of a consensus position that's forged elsewhere, that's forged elsewhere on a bigger table, one that includes the PLO executive committee. But it includes also secretary generals of the factions that are not within the PLO. So this is the body that's inclusive. Everybody has a voice. Nobody can be shut out uh, at all. Everybody has a veto. Once something is decided, this is exactly what's going to really be conveyed to the world by the head of PLO, on behalf of all of us. You see what I'm saying? So there is a compromise here. 
The title is the same. And why is this important? Because the world deals with the PLO. The, the, the world has recognized the PLO. The world does not accept this other bigger unified framework and what have you. So in this fashion, you have full partnership in decision making on matters that pertain to our national interests. Then, of course, there, there needs to be partnership on matters that relate to our government. Right. In the occupied territory. For that, we need that national unity government on which everybody from all factions is to sit. And I say top tier leadership. Now, this runs into international difficulties. So called quartet principles that anyone on a Palestinian government has to accept the conditions set out by the quartet, meaning acceptance of all of the deals that the PLO had made late before, relating to recognition of Israel's right to exist, related to renunciation of violence, and, and what have you. We know that's not going to happen. However, this is not to say that Palestinians cannot converge on anything that is potentially of interest to Israel. They can converge on something that is not the gold standard that is Oslo, but something that's better than status quo. They can converge on the concept of a truce, for sure. That happened before. It was for a period of time, from time to time, whether announced or otherwise, with US mediation sometimes, most recently actually when Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State uh, during the last war in Gaza, 2014, where there is a, an understanding on it too. So this, we know that this is something that all factions can agree on. Uh, for a, a period of time, it's not is, is, is time-bounded commitment to non-violence. It's not open-ended. You know, right. Oslo uh, is a gold standard, open-ended commitment to non-violence. This is time-bound commitment to non-violence, and I think it can be secured. Now, obviously this is not what Oslo is about, for sure, but I can't think of a single reason why a Prime Minister of Israel would reject an offer of non-violence, even if it is for a limited period of time. That's better than no such offer, that's what I'm saying. But, but let, let, let me ask you this. So, I mean, this, this is great. And we'll, yeah. we'll get reactions you know, from the audience and we'll have a chance to ask uh, about this. And it's clear that you're incredibly passionate about this and you are very convinced that we have to overcome internal problems before we can uh, 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 proceed forward. If, I guess, you know, let me ask a couple of questions and then try to take them in short order so that we can open it up for, uh, for discussion. Um, what are the incentives for Israel to change behavior? Does it have any incentives to change behavior, to accept something that is different? Um, you know, there's growing evidence that there are no incentives. You know, it, it, it's, um, you know, they, they don't exist, number one. Uh, two, in the intervening time between when you published this uh, article first or, or, or wrote it, uh, what has been the reaction? You know, what is the the uh, appetite for something like this? Are they going to listen? Are they going to uh, be open to something like this? And then third, very related to this, and that will get us perhaps into how we tie this into current um, events. How does the uh, Palestinian leadership, and I'm using that term, you know, broadly to encompass everything, PLO, Hamas, Jihad, everything else, clean house while dealing with the externalities that it has to deal with, uh, you know, coming from uh, you know the Trump administration, coming from like, the political dynamics within Israel, you know, coming from uh, an Arab uh, tone that has changed significantly um, you know, over the past few months. So, if we can try yeah. to address those things within the next five minutes, um, <laughs> and then we'll open it up. Um, you know, it's impossible when you have somebody like Salam Fayyad. I think Dana used the wrong term when she said moderate, because you can't moderate somebody like that. You don't want to moderate somebody like him. You want to hear from him. But uh, let me try to do that a little bit. Please don't, don't, don't hesitate to come stop me at the time. I understand. Uh, look, several issues. First, on the question of the subject. See, my scheme, the reason I'm passionate about this, uh, is I really think it responds to something that I see as eminently logical. It really puts us Palestinians in the driver's seat for a change. It does not really depend on whether Israel says yes or no to something. It does not depend on whether the US says yes or something. Right. It really moves us from a mode of forever waiting for a solution, for justice, to just really 
be done to us, for us, if you will. It really puts us in the driver's seat in the task of assuming full agency in our own liberation, and that's exciting, to be honest with you. So my answer is, who in the hell cares what the Prime Minister of Israel thinks or does not think, if you think like me, to be honest with you. What this is about is, is really projecting something really exciting. This is about saying to ourselves, it's about time century into the suffering, dispossession, and denial of right, existence, of, of identity, of anything, injustice, oppression, and what have you. It's about time for us to really enjoy that which is an absolute right for all people around the world, live as free people with dignity and accountable world. And guess what? We're going to do it ourselves. We're going to do it ourselves. I think it, it is so wholly positive what this is about, this is about Palestinian empowerment. It, you know, uh, uh, and, and trying to do the best we can, uh, just to really mix the issues a little bit. Talked about Trump and externalities, uh, implying um, what's said about ultimate deal and uh, uh, Jerusalem, taking it off the table and, and all of this stuff. And MBS, Bibliot, and, and, and all of that. And you know, many people look at this, and, and you know, I'm amazed uh, as a matter of fact. Look, I mean, we have every right to be kind of uh, more than anxious uh, when we see all of this. We have every right to be uh, outright angry uh, and all. But anger is not a strategy. Anger is not strategy. Uh, and in fact, it, it can be constructive. If we really turn this into an opportunity to really focus on what we really need to do ourselves, and it's Palestinian empowerment. Um, you know, what this says is, is basically, let us just turn inward and do all of those things. Let's get to the point where we're able to really come up with a program like the one I identified to you that unifies us, and we go to what well, this is the best we can do. Now, I know that you told us that you cannot accept the government except one that really accepts all of the conditions as stated. But ladies and gentlemen, for heaven's sake, when was it last that you expected the conceptual equivalent of those conditions on the Israeli side? There is not a single cabinet officer in today's Israel government, in, 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 in Israel's government today, that really unconditionally accepts to the solution. And that's really the conceptual equivalent of the conditions of Palestinian side. It never was expected formally of various Israeli governments since Oslo. Why should it really be imposed on us? I know many of us really have made this point before. My, my plea is for us to really actually do things and then, then ask for forgiveness, if you will. Instead of just arguing the point, I mean, there are two ways you really can handle this. You wait until all of us says, okay, it's green, you can go. It's all green, you can go. I don't think we should really keep it there. I don't think the word, I don't think Trump administration. You're also saying, I mean, you know, if, 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 if the impossible scenario yes. that you told, uh, it's clear you can go, there isn't anything that would emerge out of that uh, in terms of leadership, yeah. in terms of state. Exactly. And that's why I said, uh, you know, first of all, it's not going to come. You know, Trump administration is not going to really come to us and say, oh, by the way, just go ahead and fix your things, uh, go to Gaza, unify. Uh, you know, accept conditions that are not necessarily consistent with, uh, with Oslo and the rest of Obviously, they're not going to do that. I can tell you not even the EU would, would, would do this. I, I know this from experience. In 2007, I was a member of National Unity Government. That was not accepted by the United States, and it was not formally accepted by the EU either. Uh, 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 so, however, if we were to do this, and God will say, this is the best we can do, then Somebody needs to tell me, you know, why is it the uh, Prime Minister of Israel would find an offer of a time-bound commitment to non-violence uh, unacceptable? Right. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's an unstandard. So basically my point is, instead of really waiting for the clear signal, uh, I think we should just really do what we think is right, what we can do, the best we can do, and ask uh, for forgiveness. I think that's a much better way of doing things. And that, it, so so let's that just really move. That's, uh, I think I touched on issues of yeah. uh, basically the uh, ultimate deal of various components of it, top down, that is going to really happen. Well, it didn't happen before. I just don't see how that really can happen now. Right. Uh, but all the more reason for us to really turn inward and focus on that which we can do ourselves in order to 
chain of the givens and do the necessary. Do the necessary. My last point. My last point. Uh, in order for this not to continue to be a theoretical construct of sorts, we will talk about something really uh, incredibly meaningful, potentially. Uh, freedom, uh, state for our people, a home, if you will, uh, in which we can live as free people with dignity. It's very important. It's very important for us to kind of really begin to project elements of that so people can relate to that which we are aspiring to attain. It's very important for this not to really continue to be theoretical in freedom. We'd like for this to really be seen by people and felt by people in the way they are handled by the authority who's going to become a state. That's why, you know, good governance is not an afterthought in this construction. It's critical. It's absolutely critical. It is what, what really is supposed to give comfort to the people in terms of that home we are aspiring to be. You, you, you say basically start yeah. behaving like a state before you ask for a state. So and, 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 and the rest, I think, will follow. And that, that's what yeah. follow. So, I mean, I'm sure there are millions of questions on uh, everybody's mind. So, we're going to take them in sure. two, three, uh, perhaps at a time. You know, dealing with this, but I know that there are lots of other things <coughs> that people. Uh, want to ask about perhaps unrelated to uh, or not directly related to what the Prime Minister has shared with us. So let's take them two, three at a time. Uh, there's a microphone and please be quick, uh, make it a question and identify yourself first. That would be cool to know who you are and why you're here. Hi, Omar Zayed. Uh, Omar Zayed. Nice, nice to uh, hear you speak. Uh, very honored. Um, so my question is, uh, do you think that there's any substantial role that multilateral organizations like the World Bank and IMF can actually play when it comes to development projects um, in the Beza and in the West Bank? Because as you said, um, and that you alluded to, I can personally attest to the fact that you get in, into a lot of these meetings with donors, and um, particularly with an organization like the World Bank, their main incentive uh, from the get-go is really just to, bank, just to uh, rank a country based off of certain um, indicators um, to publish in their report, and really nothing tangible comes out of it. For the most part, obviously, I don't want to um, generalize for all the projects because some are useful, but simultaneously, there are many that really lead to nowhere. So I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Great, thank you. Hi, Dr. Fayad. Thank you for coming. Uh, very insightful talk. I'm Dory Fife. I'm a senior at Columbia College. Last week, the budget bill that the President of the United States signed uh, includes the Taylor Force Act, which suspends payments to the Palestinian Authority as long as some of those payments go to Palestinians who carry out attacks against, this, against Israelis. How do you expect the PA to react? Is it going to change its policy? And do you see the US actually going through with it? Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, one close to you. Yeah. The woman in the back. And then uh, we'll take the fourth one over there. I think it's Diego. Yeah. Your Excellency, uh, Yara Matar. I have like three quick questions. Um, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that it's very difficult to unite Palestinians knowing that they are so spread out even in terms of territory and their needs are so different. And maybe this is why the faction uh, exists at the moment. So how do you create this unity between uh, Palestinians in Gaza, uh, the West Bank, and Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon? while their needs are so, are so different. Um, my second question is um, that it seems that the current institutions uh, in Palestine are not very efficient, especially, I mean, it seems that there is a certain level of corruption, so how do you start building with that being um, like level zero? And uh, my third and final question is, um, what do you think is a fair solution at the moment? Because it seems, what is a fair solution at the moment with Israel? Because it seems that reverting back to uh, level one is not going to happen. Um, occupation is not likely to end. So what is a fair solution for uh, the Palestinian population? Thank you. Thanks. So we'll take uh, maybe w one more. Uh, yeah. Hi, um, Jacob Fieldy, I'm um, second year at uh, CIPA. Um, thank you, thank you for your um, for your time and for, for coming to speak to us. Uh, my question is regarding the, um, the policy of the government of uh, security collaboration with Israel. It's one of the things that your government has been known for. Um, and I want you to know how this fits in, if it does, within your framework of 
trying to project state power uh, before asking for a state? <coughs> and how would you how would you uh, fit that collaboration if if you confirm um, within your framework? Okay, that's great. What, what's the so what's the name? I don't get the name. Uh, Diego. 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 Yeah. So the questions came from Omar, uh, Dori, uh, Yara, and Diego. Let me just sort of. Uh, I think I mentioned to you, Sam, I was in Ramallah last week, yeah. and uh, um, you know, a couple of things uh, came to my mind while I was there in preparation for uh, this evening's event. I remember a time, and correct me if I'm wrong, in the early 1990s, and after the President of Tifalda, where so many of us observing from outside thought that the greatest asset the Palestinians had um, in, the, uh, in the West Bank in particular was civil society. You know, there was a very strong civil society that was taking care of things. You know, from garbage collection, when government was not operating to, um, you know, more mundane and less mundane aspects. And my impression today is that there is no civil society to speak of, that the institutions that you spoke of, that you fought very hard to build, uh, are not there. And uh, to the extent that there is civil society, it's not grassroots, it's under the thumb of the, um, um, of the, the uh, Palestinian, Palestinian Authority. The, uh, I think the issues that have come up, uh, both in terms of corruption in the questions that have come up, institution building, um, are very, very um, important ones. So again, you know, the role, is there a role for multilateral organizations? Um, how do you deal with the issue of uh, payments, uh, Andrew Watt uh, funding was cut by the US administration that we had a couple of weeks ago, a conference in Rome, I think it was, where $100 million um, came together to more than compensate for that. Do we continue doing this? You know, How do we deal with this? Um, and you, you've got the rest from your end. Uh, I know what is going on right now is a direct consequence. Uh, thank you for the questions. They're all uh, important. And I, I will try to answer all of them as well. Okay, I'll give you, how about this? I'll give you four minutes to answer those. <laughs> All of that? Yes, I really need to answer them. Okay. <laughs> so let me just get... No, just that. because I want to give, you know... Let answer. me, let me yeah. you know, first uh, respond to Diego's question. Because okay. it's kind of a, it's a lingering issue, and it's on the minds of many. I mean, a paradox, if you will, the inconsistency of so-called security coordination with the fact that there is the, uh, uh, an occupier and occupied within appearing as though the most important responsibility of the occupied people is to provide security for the occupied. It's really kind of outlandish when you really think about it um, in, in the abstract. So let, let me respond to this. First of all, uh, that's Oslo. Uh, let me just make sure everybody knows that that's what Oslo is about, uh, in part, so far as security is concerned. So it's enshrined in the agreement. Now, you said, why did Palestinians agree to something like this. Now, I think it's a legitimate question. Uh, I wasn't there, there for sure, and this is not really absorbed myself from responsibility or anything. After all, I was prime minister, and I would not do that. I would not do that. But I can really imagine what the rationale was. The rationale was, we know that this is not perfect force. Uh, it has many flaws, but it's for a limited period of time. Mm -hmm. you can really try to put yourself in the shoes of those who are really thinking through this. Uh, uh, being away, uh, uh, wanting to really see a, a solution that brings about justice, somebody said something about <coughs> fairness, uh, uh, what do I think a fair solution is, uh, and all, uh, prospect of that happening, uh, made this palatable. Uh, it, it, it sounds odd, but it was not supposed to be open-ended. So if it were, you know, come to us, agree to those terms, uh, provide uh, security, coordinate on security, and make it your import, most important tasking to provide for the security of the state of Israel while you're under occupation, regardless of how long the occupation will endure, that's a different story. That's not what this was about. So regardless of what appeared as, you know, imperfect, uh, the imperfection of this, it, it, it all was supposed to be for a limited period of time that in the minds of the leadership was going to really come to an end and culminate in sovereignty for Palestinians, in a state for Palestinians. So we, we do this 
regardless of you know how little sense it makes on the surface of it, but it's going to lead to something. And that's one of the biggest problems that we really face now. An old paradigm whose timeline has expired, with the commitments are still in place. That was not, you know, there is nothing in Oslo that says this is an agreement forever. So it, it, it lapsed. The segregation of the territory, I, I mentioned Area C, Area A, and Area B, this should have ended in 1997. You know, according to the letter of the agreement itself, Oslo itself should have expired in May 1999. Uh, so that is why I, I think, you know, this definitely needs to be fixed. Okay. Beginning with what I've been referred to as the most flawed structural, uh, the most serious structural flow, which is the asymmetry. Uh, in, involved in the recognition of rights. It's absolutely important for any meaningful process between us and Israel to be preceded by a recognition by Israel of our natural rights as provided for under international law. Right to return, right to self-determination, right to a fully sovereign Palestinian state on the territory Israel occupied in 1967 in its entirety, including East Jerusalem. We need a recognition of those as rights. It's not to say we would not negotiate. Negotiations are or should be about arrangements. They should be about assurances, but they should not be about principles. In addition, we did, going back to 1993, recognize Israel's right to exist in peace and security, which is really a most advanced form of recognition of a national right. But for Israel, to be honest with you, we got nothing. So it's not really only this, as I said. It's, it's, a, it's a, a process of recalibration. And this process toward unity on the Palestinian side, how are we going to really bring around the table on the Palestinian side people who no longer agree with one state for two state solutions? So we forget about two state solutions. We know there is a significant body of Palestinians who no longer subscribe to the notion of two states. And basically what I'd say to everyone, regardless of whether you are for one state, for two states, whatever, is that we should not really get bogged down by division over this issue today. What we should say is that we are prepared to engage in a meaningful political process that could lead to something, provided that we have, ahead of the beginning of that process, a formal recognition of our national rights. And I say to those who do not agree with my worldview, why are we really going to continue to divide, you know, to, to be divided over an issue of what state we would like to be, so long as we do not have in hand the recognition of our national rights that are accounted to you? Right. If and when that happens, that when we Palestinians have to make up our mind. But we don't have to make up our mind today. You understand what I'm saying? If we come to a point in time where Israel is prepared to recognize our national rights, that's when we should go back to people and say, now we really have something working. What do you want? Mm. Mm. But why should we really delay you know, the task of unifying ourselves, which is critical today, when we do not have anything in hand? We do not have two states in hand. We do not have one state in hand. Those of us who really uh, 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 think that, oh, if we just really let this run, uh, sooner or later, we're going to really have majority. Well, I can tell you. <laughs> We don't have to really wait forever for that to happen. Already, already, in what we regard our, as our <coughs> ancestral homeland, from Rafah to uh, Ras Nakura in the north, the territory between River Jordan and Mediterranean, which uh, uh, Israel calls the land of Israel, uh, 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 land of Israel, which can neutrally be called British Mandate Palestine, there are more non Jews than than Jews in that territory already today. And where is that one state? There is no such thing. It's an illusion. There is no such thing. I don't see the reality of one state that they make it here. What I see actually is the reality of nearly four states. That is really actually happening. One in Gaza, a state look alike, and another Palestinian state look alike on 40% of the West Bank, areas A and B. And some settlers state that, or state look alike for, for the settlers and state of Israel. So the status quo. The status quo. Yeah. So, you know, the, it's not really going to just basically happen. Uh, so we really need to work hard, and I don't think we really should continue to divide ourselves. So a whole process of recalibration must take place, beginning with recognition of our rights, and, and that's how we really take it. 
projects, uh, you know, we definitely should take uh, an important role, assume an important role in deciding, uh, Omar, what, what projects and, and, uh, and all. It is my view that under the basically uh, tight constraints associated with trying to really bring about development under occupation with the highly capricious control regime associated with it, we need to be pragmatic. Uh, our strategy should not be one of uh, uh, choosing to implement few uh, large infrastructural projects. Those are extremely difficult to do in the best of circumstances. Under occupation, with uh, a lot of permits that we really have to get from the Israeli authorities, with no handbook to tell you what to do to get the permit, and what have you, and by design, by the way, uh, uh, it's better to really actually go for the largest number uh, possible of small projects that can be implemented very quickly, uh, particularly in marginalized uh, and rural areas, including in LAC. Now, you know, this is an example that really actually flies in the face of those who really say you cannot really achieve any empowerment under occupation. I, I beg to differ. We were able to actually implement a number, a very large number of projects in LAC some behind the wall, as a matter of fact. Uh, like water works for farmers, uh, rehabilitation of them. You know, nobody can tell me this is not, uh, I mean, yes, this is not really the end or and be all, but I can tell you that when people really started to see uh, artesian wells being rehabilitated, they started to really actually uh, do some brand acclimation, and you know, farmers have started to really feel good about their prospects, etc., etc. Uh, this is really about empowerment. You can really do something. And civil society, you said something about civil society. Uh, uh, very active in, in, in this area and others. A uh, huge sort of strength for us. That's what really sustained us over many decades uh, under occupation before the PA showed up. Unfortunately, when the PA showed up, and this is not unique to Palestine, uh, throughout the region, uh, public sector, government, state, you know, uh, official part of the state, uh, tends to view uh, civil society with uh, suspicion. Uh, you can view all civil society. Yeah, yes, yeah. I have uh, an experience uh, without yeah, the personal experience. Right. Yeah, I have a, a personal experience with this, but I didn't have to have a personal experience to know this, yeah. uh, for sure. And uh, you know, there's it, always this uh, kind of uh, uh, view with, with the suspicion and all, uh, and particularly when, when you are in informative stages. I mean, here you have the PA trying to assert itself and presence. Uh, did not really, maybe saw as competition, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, coming from uh, civil society and all. Uh, I think that's wrong and wrong headed. It's wrong and wrong headed. Uh, civil society is a key source of strength, uh, actually, has been uh, very much involved uh, and active in, in providing for the welfare of people, uh, vitally important areas uh, health, education, care for the elderly, uh, handicapped, and, and what have you. Uh, and yes, in the implementation of those small infrastructure projects, and including in areas where you couldn't do that under occupation or whatnot, with, with brilliance, uh, imagination, and creativity. That definitely has to be fixed, right. uh, as does the state uh, uh, of institution. I, all I can say on this is, I mean, I agree with what's said about the quality of the institution's capacity to deliver uh, in, in, in a corruption-free environment, to the fullest extent that can be attained. Uh, it's a duty uh, of those who govern to really see to it that they do things this way. It's an absolute must uh, if you're person and doing it under occupation, not only to prove that we really state work, uh, you know, there ought not be any conditions attached to our right to self-determination in the way that some suggest sometimes. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, not necessarily by thinking about it too much. But I, I honestly believe it's, it, it's an integral part of getting people to really begin to get a sense of what it means what life will be under a state that's really built on the foundational, universally shared foundation principles of respect for citizens, equality, non-discrimination, uh, tolerance, uh, inclusiveness, uh, 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 fairness uh, in, in service delivery, uh, and all of that sort of thing. Uh, where everybody feels they have a, 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 a fair sure. job. Where the state, where there's a market failure that is also able to effectively intervene to take care of the needs of those who just could not make it, who fell through the cracks here and there. It, a vision for the kind of state we want for ourselves is what we really should start this exercise with. A vision that really lives up to those principles. Thank you. Great. So let's uh, 
here, and there are two over there. Not many from this side. None of our faculty colleagues. Uh... Good evening. Okay. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. My name is Liron Brody. Uh, Liron. I've Liron, yes. I have two questions. One on the on the topic of refugee camp maintenance within the West Bank and within Gaza. Yeah. I'm just wondering what uh, your thoughts are on that. And then the second part on the question of the BDS movement. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's a very uh, sore topic or a very uh, passionate one. Um, my personal feeling is that it's actually strengthened the Israeli right, and in that sense, has kind of worked against Palestinian uh, interests. But I would love to hear what your thoughts are on that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, maybe that, and I also need to really come back to the question I asked about Tyler Force. Uh, about not, yeah, about Tyler Force. I didn't respond to ah, the yeah. question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Noam. Uh, I wonder if you think any of the potential succeeder of President Abbas is repre like representing or can adopt your approach of first behave like a state and then ask for a state. So, what is that? Okay. Just do them quickly. I mean, it's a great question. It's very crisp. And, uh... um, hi, thank you so much for speaking with us. My name is Josh Schwartz. Um, I uh, lived in Jerusalem for a year, and the question of whether or not the Palestinian residents of Jerusalem should vote in the municipal elections, does that, could that be incorporated into your, your strategy of building strong institutions? Is it, where does the Jerusalem community play a role in that? Thank you. The woman just behind them. I'm Josh. Hi, um, my name is Munal Farah, I'm from uh, Beja Al Palestine, so welcome to uh, again. Um, my question, I guess, um, uh, the underlying foundation is for my question, uh, is the distinction, I would like to hear it from you, is the distinction between what constitutes nation state building versus a liberation movement. And the reason why I ask about that is because we all know that, you know, your, your, your um, basically assumption is uh, you know, building the institution will, uh, you know, will uh, achieve liberation, right? Self-determination. And in that sense, um, I'm asking if whether you are not equating nation-state building by way of in institutionalizing with the Palestinian right to self-determination. Um, and uh, in that sense, I have, uh, my question is twofold. The first fold is how can we build institutions if Palestinians themselves don't have a consensus on what constitute Palestinian nationhood. And you mentioned uh, the 1967, uh, uh, you know, that's the right to nationhood or whatever, but you are leaving also out um, the uh, question of representation when it comes to refugeehood, for example, and so forth. So um, the right to return or the self-determination for refugees could be completely different uh, in terms of conceptualizing from what you know the institution of the Palestinian Authority may perceive them to be, obviously. So in that sense, I'm asking that uh, part of the question. The second uh, part of the question is, if you are suggesting that uh, building the building of institution institutions as a way of liberalizing, you know, liberate self determination or liberation of Palestine. Um, and of course, assuming that even if we did agree what constitute uh, Palestinian nationhood, um, then how would you possibly answer the critique that links the building of institutions with a, a global economy that is increasingly implicated with not only just the maintaining of the oppressive situation and conditions of Palestinians, but also with uh, emerging struggles of people all over the world? So in that sense, aren't you suggesting that nation state building by the framework of institutionalizing um, is not inherently oppressive in so far that the nation, the, what I'm saying, I guess, the nation state, the institutions become basically the very condition of oppression. So um, for, the, for the Palestinian uh, uh, liberation. That yes, that. so okay. that's, that's my, uh, my okay. question. Fantastic, thank you. So, um, we need to make sure that we don't run over time, not only because you have other commitments, but because we have a terrific event that starts at 6.30, that's organized by the Center for Palestine Studies, that's taking place at the Lampas Center uh, for Performing Arts in the Screen Room uh, at Manhattanville. And it's the uh, screening of the movie Hunting Ghosts by Raed and Johnny. And Raed is here, and he will be in conversation with James Shannons. Did I get all of that correctly, Dirty? Okay. 
Um, so I mean, it takes half hour to get there. No, no, no. We will we'll get there fast. We'll, we'll run over there. Uh, so we, I'm going to add my own last question yeah. so that we don't come back and we give you the final, final word. And that is, uh, in my introduction, I forgot to mention that uh, Salam is now a visiting senior scholar, actually, at Princeton, at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. He's also a um, senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Um, the question is, what's next uh, for Salam Fayyad? And, and you know, will you entertain the thought of trying to put into action um, the ideas that you have put forward um, to us uh, today? Uh, so if you can deal with this, deal with refugee camp maintenance, uh, yeah. BDS, yeah, yeah, uh, you, you've got them all. Yeah, and, and, uh, um, and if I miss something, please remind me, because I do mean to respond to everything. <laughs> okay, it, thank you. Extent, it can. Maybe not satisfactorily, but, but uh, I should acknowledge two questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, one first uh, related to the uh, budget without money for Palestinian Stand for Force Act, uh, the annual. Uh, the issue is not really a new one. Uh, it may be new to some. Uh, and uh, fundamentally, I can tell you for sure that this is very well known, and the PA has been very transparent about it from the very beginning. Why do I say that? Uh, I know. I was Minister of Finance, uh, and I was uh, uh, Prime Minister, and we uh, actually uh, are given a lot of credit uh, being amongst the first in the Arab world to kind of really actually post our budget uh, on, on the web. Uh, and, and I can tell you more than that. Uh, I can tell you, uh, as a matter of fact, part of those payments, at least, is executed through the Israel system. To me, this is not this is not something that can really it is hidden. No one knows anything about or, or, or whatever. Uh, it, it, it is coming up. It's an issue, uh, and it has really become politicized a lot. And so we definitely we, we have to deal with it. We, we acknowledge that we do have a problem. But what I really would like to submit to you for kind of reflection is the hypothesis that this is a sign of breakdown, uh, basically. In other words, you know, I told you what I told you about this being very well known, including first and foremost of the security establishment of Israel and the political establishment of Israel. I know that for a fact. But it's really a sign of the breakdown of relations, breakdown of process that really has become the political issue has become. It is an issue of narrative. It is an issue of narrative fundamentally. And this is how I would deal with it. If I were, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, it, was a and it, you know, it did come up while I was Prime Minister. It did come up while I was Finance Minister. And this is, I can tell you, uh, how I responded. It, it, it used to come up in the context of visiting delegations telling me uh, about this being an issue for their parliaments, uh, issue in the media and whatnot. And I always offered to really be taken to their parliaments to really have them explain it to them or they offered ways in which they could be comfortable with how their own assistance is being used. But I repeatedly told them uh, what I'm telling you now. Uh, this is an issue of narrative that the PA is going to really find it extremely difficult to deal with in, in a political sense uh, just because it has become politicized. Uh, issues of narrative are not insignificant. Uh, they are at the core of this. This is a case, after all, of vastly diametrically opposed narratives. And we must really look at it in the context that I've just described to you. Put this way, uh, you know, it's not really going to be a case of I do this, you do that. But it's really going to be a case of let's really think about something constructive that we can all do toward everybody kind of really getting to and settling in an equilibrium state that we can all live with. Uh, that's when issues like this can really be dealt with better away from the noise much like what I would say about BDS and all. I think it's really extremely outlandish, and that's really my, my reaction to this. Uh, for uh, uh, Israel, and uh, uh, in the way it's supported on this issue with automaticity, the issue of BDS, to continue to think that it can continue to do what it has been doing forever, for decades, uh, keeping the occupation, uh, the operations that came with it, the capriciousness, and uh, the indignity for the people and all, and uh, escape, uh, uh, you know, accountability. Uh, I think it's really expecting too much, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, BIPOC can be disruptive, and I think in terms of uh, 
We have said an aspect of it that are extremely uh, delicate and sensitive. I, I, I can understand that. At the same time, I think it really must be understood that there are consequences for continuing to front international law uh, all the way, uh, without any without any regard for uh, you know the rights of the other. The other happens to really be a people deprived of the most basic of rights. All of this, said, I can tell you, uh, from my own point of view, uh, I do know, I don't know what, uh, that we do have a rendezvous with freedom, like uh, uh, all aspiring people who really aspire. I, I, in my heart, I really believe this. I don't know when that's going to happen. When it does, I believe it would have happened on the strength of an empowerment agenda for the Palestinians, not anything else, not anything else. So, yeah, this can happen, and I think it's a natural reaction to what was going on on the Israeli side. But what's really going to really get us to where we're going is an agenda that is pivoted 100% on the pursuit of self-empowerment by Palestinians. So that's what's really going to really get us there. That's, that's what I really want to believe in. Self empowerment, of course, of determination. Yes, right. it, yes, it, uh, actually, that's, that's what it is. Uh, this kind of really relates to the question uh, 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 not to really skip the question about whether this is really a matter of consensus, you know, the business of um, you know, building uh, 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 on the way to, to freedom uh, or as an instrument, uh, uh, and all, which relates to the questions uh, also asked by you, a series of questions. I, I think, actually, Safwan did ask me before, uh, you know, what went right, what went wrong, why didn't. One of the reasons, one of the reasons this agenda did not really come to full fruition. Uh, I'm not really saying it didn't work at all. It did in, in, in some important ways. I mean, relative to its stated objective, the program that we launched back in 2009, I think it succeeded relative to its objective. The objective was, in two years, we're going to be ready for state. That's what we said. And in less than two years, a year and a half into this, in April 2011, the world gave us that birth certificate. The world actually, in the form of a, a, a donor community, Convening in Brussels, the United States, the European Union, Israel was there, the United Nations, World Bank, IMF, all of these institutions basically said Palestinians have crossed the threshold of readiness for statehood. Mm -hmm. So, relative to the immediate objective, we definitely got what we said we're going to really do. Relative to the political objective of all of this, for that to really serve as an instrument of liberation, that didn't happen. One of the reasons was that this was a program that was not genuinely adopted by all of the leadership at all levels. It was generally adopted by the cabinet. So one of the things that we really need to rectify instead of really ditching it is to ensure that this is really accepted, that it's really a key point of discourse for this unified leadership framework, you know, convening around a bigger table, one that includes everybody, to really make this central so everybody can agree to it. Everybody is dedicated to it. It requires official involvement, yes, but it requires mobilization, civil society, people at all levels, young and old. There's election in the scheme, by the way. Some six months before the expire of this interim period, there's election. There's election. Uh, people then get to choose. What is that we want to decide? Should we really extend what kind of negotiations, etc.? So there's an input that's going to be formally. But after political space is open for people to participate, particularly the young, two thirds of Palestinian people, two thirds of Palestinian people, Alive today, were either born after the Second Intifada or were too young to remember what was happening before it. They need to be included. So, people were telling me about this, in this part, in response to the question uh, about whether we have a notion of what nationhood is and what it isn't. All of this is really important, but why are we discussing this? And I said this. Why are we discussing this and coming to terms on it? We have to remember. There are some two thirds of us are completely disenfranchised. It's not only a question of diaspora and, and you know, people only in the West Bank, Gaza, what about people in this one? What about the two thirds that I just talked to you about? They're not included. They're completely disenfranchised. They don't believe in PLO, factions, this, that, or other thing. They need to be included for sure. It's important, the issues that you raise, but let me just make sure I'm clearly understood on this one. First of all, on question of rights, I myself enumerated them with reason in order for people to know where I stand. On the question of what constitutes our national rights as provided for under international law, I counted them. 
and they deal with all of us Palestinians, not only people who are living in the West Bank and Gaza today, in the territory of Israel occupied in 1970, Palestinians everywhere. That's number one. Again, I also said that we need to keep PLO. PLO, I didn't make it this, but it is what it is. It is the sole legitimate representative of all Palestinians. So it, it is the body that's going to really be dealing on behalf of all of us. So what I say, what I say, I do not say it in, you know, with, with detachment to any segment of, of the Palestinian uh, population, uh, not only in Palestine, but elsewhere in the world, and they need to be included. That's part of the self-renewal that needs to happen. While we're doing these things, though, and discussing, you know, whether this is really going to be enough uh, to liberate or not, let's remember two things. First of all, while we're discussing all these things, there are real, genuine needs for people, Palestinians, who live today in extremely difficult conditions. People talk about the situation in Gaza, and I 100% agree, but this is true of Palestinians elsewhere, including refugee camps, or refugee camps, everywhere, especially in Lebanon. Of course, uh, the situation in Syria, uh, Yarmouk refugee camp, etc. While we're discussing, there is serious misery going on. All I'm really saying is, yes, all of this is important. We need to discuss this. But while we're discussing it, we need to agree on a transitional period where we can begin today to deal with the problems of people. We all agree on the need for people to withstand the adverse, to persevere. That's what you really find politically. You're standing up, giving speech after speech from behind the podium, calling on people to persevere. So more Alaykum uh, al persevere uh, under adversity of occupation. But a question, how are people continue to be, going to continue to be able to persevere if they do not have schools to send their children to, if they do not have access to safe water, if they do not have adequate healthcare facilities? You know, development is not really a, a, a luxury in, in the way I view things. It's an absolute necessity. So yes to all what you said. But please think about all else that must be happening today. The last thing I would say on this is the following. This is really about liberation. This is about Palestinians being able to exercise that which is an absolute right for all peoples around the world. Right to express, a right to expression, to self-determination. What it is that they find a meaningful, fair, well, fair was viewed, uh, uh, manifestation or expression of our exercise of right to self-determination. I personally submit respectfully to all that there is nothing more liberating in this quest for liberation than actually projecting the reality of our state on the ground in the face of occupation, in spite of the occupation of the There is nothing more transformative. Nothing can be more transformative. That you know, sense of fairness you know, fair solution. What do I regard? I don't think a solution is going to really happen tomorrow. It's not around the corner. So my sense of what is fair or not fair is not really important, to be honest with you. Because we're not about to sign a deal. And it's not really going to happen. We must accept that this is really a, 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 a struggle that's going to take longer rather than shorter period of time. All what I'm really arguing for, if you will, and I always say that we Palestinians are due, if not overdue, for a lucky bounce of the board. Or I really submit to, you, submit to you respectfully, we need to endeavor to strive to be on the playing field when that lucky bounce of the ball happens to do something with it. You know what I'm saying? That's all. It's not to preempt anything. It's not to really annul or, or negate need for a discussion of these important issues. It's really about really us getting started to do that, which I think will take us there. It's highly emancipating, it's liberating, and I recommend that you try it.